taking home the A's, as they say. Uh, so I'm recording myself. All right, so if you will turn in your scripture, in your Bibles this morning, if you would like to uh, Isaiah 7. Isaiah 7. And I'll read aloud. There's a lot of different names here. There's a lot of different kingdoms described and it may be hard to follow. I will unpack it, but the last verse will be most important and I think you'll recognize it. <clears throat> when Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, king Rezin of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem. But they could not overpower it. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahaz and the people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. The Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, Shear Jashub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field. Say to him, Be careful, keep calm, do not be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of fierce anger of Rezin and Aram, the son of uh, Remaliah. Aram, Ephraim, and Remaliah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, Let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart, let us divide it among ourselves, and make the son of Tabeel king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says, It will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resident. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered to, to be a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask yourself, ask the Lord, your God, for a son. Whether it in the deepest of hearts or the highest of heights. But Ahaz said, I will not. I will not put the Lord to test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you, O house of David. It is not enough to try the faith. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. On Palm Sunday, we celebrate the entrance of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem, riding on the back of a donkey. At many churches, kids in the congregation will wave palm branches and will say, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And for a moment there, when we reflect on that, there seems to be a lot of hope. There seems to be a lot of hope for these people of Jerusalem that have been awaiting a Savior. But it's temporary for some. In fact, we hear murmurs in the crowd of people identifying who this Jesus is. Isn't this the son of Mary and Joseph? Isn't he a carpenter? He's not the son of God. And so there's hope for a moment for some. But it's temporary. The text we just read was probably the most notable prophecy of Jesus Christ's coming, and it came 700 years before his birth. That's a long time. No one heard the original prophecy and actually saw its fulfillment. So these people are waiting. They're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ. I mean, they're waiting a long time. I'm talking longer than any traffic jam to be stuck into due, due to holiday traffic from uh, most people traveling uh, in a decade during the Thanksgiving holiday. Longer than any lines you'll have to stand in while waiting to purchase uh, gifts at a cash register. Longer than I had to wait for Thanksgiving lunch, which was supposed to be ready at 2 p.m. My father was cooking this Sunday. It was supposed to be ready at 2 p.m., but it turned into a Thanksgiving dinner and was ready at 7. 
keep in mind, I starved myself from breakfast so that I would intensify my hunger for the Thanksgiving meal. Don't think your pastor was fasting. <laughs> Probably shouldn't be. These people waited a long time. Um, and, they, and they needed a Savior. Now, we have the benefit, right? We know at the end of the story is we have received salvation. Christ came. He was born. He, he, he performed miracles. He showed us how to love. And he was crucified and died for our sins and rose again. And that happened 2,000 years ago. But they had to wait a long time for that. We know how it is. And so today, as we remember what Christ did, we're reminded of this characteristic of hope. Um, I, I made a mistake on Friday night. I decided to get into a discussion with family members about politics. That was not good. Um, and, and I'm never going to go there as a pastor. There's no place for that. There's a separation of church and state. I am going to support this congregation, though, and praying for their leaders, praying for this nation, uh, locally, state, and federally. I think that's important that we do that, and there's biblical uh, precedent for that. But I still think I can say this. We feel divided in our country. A lot of us do, right? A lot of us do feel like our nation has been divided. And we can talk about politics all day until we're blue in the face. But you want to know something? If you read the Bible, it was a lot worse back then. It was a lot worse. You read Kings, you read 1 Kings, you read 2 Kings, you read Judges, a little bit of Samuel. I mean, we see some division in the land. So first of all, I read about a lot of different um, uh, territories. This king, this land, this king, this land. Um, you often hear the land of Judah referred to as the house of David, or, um, or it's referred to as uh, the Holy Land. And it's got those different names because it's the lower, if you picture Israel, like, like just the way I'm stretching my hands, down here you have Judah. And Judah has Jerusalem, and up here is what's referenced as Israel. And it's split up into two different territories, Israel is. So there's two kings of northern Israel, and there's a king of Judah. And they're always going at each other. Now, during David's time, they were together. They were all one. That's why David was such a king that we talk about a lot with his love and reverence for God, because he was able to get everyone in line with each other. But we've got civil war going on after his death, more so over after his, his son's death. And, and, and we witness this here in this text with these kings plotting against the king of Judah in Jerusalem where the temple is. That's the holy land. That's where people go to worship. So that's kind of, you know, your, your hot spot. What, is, what does all this mean? Well, if you open up Kings, if you open up First Kings, if you open up Second Kings, you're going to read a lot about kings that did things the right way. And you're going to read a whole lot about the kings that did it the wrong way. It goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And once, when I was studying this one time, I was asking myself, God, what does this mean? Why do I have to keep reading about these communities that just couldn't get it right? And um, he, he gave me a dream. It was a weird dream. I'm going to tell you that. A really weird dream. Have you ever had a dream that's just so real it feels like a movie? Like if I asked you to describe it right now, you could describe the colors of that person in that dream. Um, colors of their shirt and that dream that you had 10 years ago, but you felt like you had it yesterday. Well, I had one of those dreams, and maybe I was married for, uh, to Jacinthia for about a year, and what had happened was, in this dream, I was being chased by bounty hunters, okay? I was on the run. I was, I was rogue. No, uh, but I was, on the, I was on the run, and um, I faked my death so that these bounty hunters would stop pursuing me. And this is how you really know it has no merit. It's a bizarre dream. The uh, receiving corp of the Green Bay Packers really helped me get away and fake my death. <laughs> can explain that one. Um, but, uh, <laughs> these fighters, I, I don't know why I drink that, but um, what was interesting to me is when I, when, when I revealed myself to my family, and I said, hey, I'm alive. My father was happy. My, my mother was overjoyed. My friends and family were joyed. I went up to my wife and I said, honey, I'm alive. She goes, yeah, okay. <laughs> I was like, no. Come to find out, she had a boyfriend. And I was like, I, 
I, I mean, I woke up and, and uh, you know, just there was just like this this feeling in my heart, like uh, like oh, I've been just you know robbed of my, of my love, and uh, you can imagine the feeling when I woke up in the middle of the night and just bare hug this empty. Um, but like I, it, this dream was so real for me, and I was like, what does this dream mean? What does this mean? And and, I'm, and keep in mind, I'm studying kings, I'm studying first kings, I'm studying second kings, and I'm seeing these few kings that got it right, a lot of kings that got it wrong, and I opened up my Bible, and I wrote down my dream, you, you, you know, you're supposed to write down your dream if you get a really interesting dream, because the Lord may be trying to tell you something, and as I'm writing down this dream, and I've got this consciousness of these kings that just got it wrong, and some that, some that got it right in my head, I'm looking at my wall, and I see the pictures of our wedding, and I'm, in, I'm actually wearing a suit, and, and I thought back to what I was thinking that day. I said, my love will be enough. My love will be enough to make this marriage special. Um, nothing can stop us. No, nothing can come, come, yeah, can come in between us. Our love will be enough. We don't need anything else. And I realized just right then, like, how many couples think that before they get married? And it doesn't always work out, right? And then I recognized a pattern. The kings that got it right, you know what they did? Before their reign, they brought about the most glorious worship ceremony you can ever imagine in your entire life. Solomon, David, Hezekiah, Josiah, they did not make their own initiative the priority. They made God the priority. They put him first. And from that day forward, me and my wife have prayed with each other every single day so that we know that our power alone won't work. But with God, he will be the glue, he will be the adhesive for our marriage. But I identified that with these kings of Israel. So I thought about what that meant, you know, and um, was able to apply that to my life. Um, and there's still a problem with that, though. There's still a problem with that whole picture of these good kings of Israel that got it right by making God their priority. Because, yes, their kingdom was righteous. Yes, they um, did right in the eyes of the Lord. This was a common uh, terminology you see in the kings. They did right in the eyes of the Lord. But there's something that happened at the end of each one of these kings' reign. There was peace in the land for 40 years. Or there was peace in the land for 20 years. Or there was peace among the people for 30 years. Guess what happened after that time? It went back down here. Their son, you know, did wrong in the eyes of the Lord. Or he worshipped some other uh, god. In fact, the king we just read about, that God spoke to, sacrificed his son. Sacrificed his son. Which is detestable to the eyes of the Lord. Um, so, I'm thinking to myself, how does this apply? What do we do? And my daughter's running under my legs right now. Um, and, and, and it's interesting, because with that, even though these kings got it right, even though they made God their priority, it was temporary, wasn't it? 40 years isn't that long. 20 years isn't that long. 60 years, 100 years. had to send us a Savior that would last in eternity. That still didn't satisfy my curiosity. Because why of all these kings did God reveal the most um, recognized prophecy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Why did he reveal it to such an um, evil king that, that kills his own son? Does anyone know why he did that? I think he did that because Jesus didn't come for the people that um, made him priority. He didn't come for the good kings. He didn't come for the good saints. He came for the least, the lost, and the last. Even the people that we don't think that, 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 they, that they deserve it. God still finds a way to love these people and give them an opportunity 
freeing themselves to fall in love with him and turn from their evil ways. And so God gives us a prophecy about a little baby boy that will change the world, born on a virgin, and he presents that to an evil king. He gives hope. And it's not 40 year hope, it's not 60 year hope, it's not 100 year hope. want y'all to share it. I really do. That's what this season is about, but it's really what being a Christian is about is, is about all the time. Sharing that hope. Driving home yesterday, me and my wife heard this amazing study. It was very powerful. Um, it was done by Cornell University, and what they had done is they had given kids toys, and they measured their happiness by trying to see... Um, um, how they reacted based on where that gift came from. So they gave the kid a toy, and they said, oh, it's from the lab technicians here. And then they gave another kid that same toy, and they said, it's from a little girl. Happiness off the scales for the individual that received the toy from an actual person that they could identify and picture in their minds. They did a follow-up study on the person who <coughs> gave this did a study of the people, of the kids that chose not to share, and they did a study on the children that willingly chose to share. Now, the individuals that received the toy and kept it for themselves, their happiness was average, but the individuals that gave the toy, they were happier than the recipients of the gift, and they were happier than the ones that, certainly, that kept the gift to themselves. There is joy in sharing this hope, it's eternal, forever. It's not just for you, it's for you to share. So I want y'all to do that as your pastor and as someone who um, is really himself dealing with this. Now, I'm, I, don't, I don't ever tell anyone, you know, go do this, you do that. I'm, the Lord deals with me and tells them where I can improve. And so I'm just going to be open and honest and professional so that hopefully you can make those same, back, same applications to yourself. Now maybe there's a uh, Maybe there's something in your life right now where you felt that you haven't accepted that hope. Or maybe you've been selfish with that hope and you haven't given it. Or maybe you put your hope in other things. That's okay. We're all at different stages and ages in our relationship with God. But I would like you right now to really think about how you can bring that hope into your life, accept it, and allow it into your heart and give it to others. And if you want to pray about that this morning, um, I'd like you to do that with me now. Uh, there's not any space to kneel at this altar, but you can pray with me.